Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> I want to thank the Children and Youth Pavilion for starting off our late night session on a 7 p.m. on one of the last days of the COP. <laughs> I hope everyone else is feeling as positive. Um, yeah, I just want to welcome everyone here in person and online to this really interesting session. My name is Katie McCoshin and I'm the Policy and International Engagement Manager at the Food and Land Use Coalition, also known as FOLU. It's my pleasure to moderate this evening's session on decoupling agriculture from deforestation, presenting critically win-win solutions for climate, livelihoods and food security. 2021 was an unprecedented year of mobilization around food systems and land issues. We had the UN Food System Summit, we had COP26, which saw lots of different announcements on deforestation and agriculture. And right now, not only do we find ourselves in the middle of a party, um, but we've got ourselves COP27, which has four different pavilions on food and agriculture. And as Foley, we've been part of the Food Systems Pavilion, so it's really great to be here with our friends at FAO and really kind of spreading the message around COP. Today, we've also had um, President Lula arriving, being welcomed kind of back as the saviour of the Amazon. We all know that tropical forests are home to a significant amount of biodiversity, but they're also critically important for the climate change, nutrition and livelihoods. In 2021 alone, the tropics lost an equivalent of 10 football pitches a minute. Ultimately, there's no pathway to limiting global warming to below 1.5 degrees unless we immediately stop reverse deforestation. With every increment of warming, food production systems will become more susceptible to climate extremes. And this, of course, has really critical impacts on livelihoods, nutrition and our population. This week, we've heard the news that we've reached a global population of 8 billion. So this really has never been more critical to join the dots on all these integrated issues. As Foley, we work with nine partners in six countries to accelerate a holistic transformation in food systems. And we work on 10 critical transitions, one of which is to protect and restore nature, which is, as you can see, very relevant to today's session and it's also Biodiversity Day, so another great link there. Transforming food systems is a real critical economic opportunity, $4.5 billion a year. We're now going to go into this 60-minute session. It's quite tight. We've got a lot of speakers. We've got a lot of great content to get forward. Um, I was going to introduce Tina Van Ehen, the Deputy Director of the FAO Sports Tree Division, but Tina unfortunately can't be with here with us today. So we're going to turn to Amy Deschel, who's the leader of the FAO's Forest and Climate Team in Tina's absence. Thank you so much, Katie, and I really we do appreciate this partnership with FOLU and we're, we're just honored to have you here with us today. So good evening to all of you here. Good evening to all of those online. There are many, um, so we're very happy. We do have a party that just started next door, but that can only give good energy into the room. So let's enjoy it. So I am pleased to welcome you to our event, Decoupling Agriculture from Deforestation, Win-Wins for Climate Livelihoods and Food Security. And at FAO, we are so pleased to see climate change linkages to agri-food systems featured so prominently at, at COP27. And as we all know, agriculture and forestry are closely linked and bear mutual benefits. We also know that agriculture currently drives up to 90% of deforestation globally. So there is something that we need to figure out to promote the win-wins between agriculture and forestry. And so while we face the major challenge of feeding the world while protecting ecosystems and forests, we can certainly turn this challenge into an opportunity. And we will hear today very concrete ways to transition to a more sustainable agriculture and scale up integrated approaches to landscape management and production. So agri-food systems transformation is critical to halting and reversing forest loss and land degradation, combat climate change and ensure food security. And you know, last year in Glasgow, more than 140 governments committed to the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forests and Land Loose to take action in this regard. 
And these guys are also very happy about those commitments. That was a big moment for forestry. So, and this year, interestingly, FAO's um, members at both the Committee on Agriculture and the Committee on Forestry agreed to strengthen FAO's mandate to support countries and enhance important linkages between agriculture and forestry with the first joint item on, on these topics between the committees. So policy coherence, integrated land use planning, better data and evidence, scaling up the innovative approaches that we'll hear about today, and promoting responsible supply chains are, are really all recognized and, and, and they're called on by FAO's member countries. So every stakeholder has a, an important role to play. Um, public sector actions are underway in consumer and producer countries. Um, small holders and producer organizations must be mobilized, um, you know, as innovative approaches need to be grounded in local realities. Local communities and indigenous people must be fully engaged. We've seen a larger than ever indigenous presence at this COP, and that's a really good signal for, for this kind of transformation. And private sector actors who, who made early commitments to eliminate deforestation from supply chains are moving in the right direction, but certainly implementation can be boosted. So these and other points are highlighted in the recent publication, Halting Deforestation from Agriculture Value Chains, the Role of governance, Governments. This is on your chairs. So just pick it up, scan the QR code, and you will have access to that publication, which we encourage you to read. Um, FAO has long worked with countries to design and implement concrete actions to reduce forest loss and degradation, support sustainable production, food security, and better livelihoods through key initiatives and programs. For example, the UN Red Program's lens on climate change, but also the forest and farm facility that helps get technical capacity to the ground, and the ecosystem approach to crop production intensification team support on agroecology and agroforestry. So FAO's work to enable and boost transformational change has also been enriched in the GEF-7 impact programs on food systems, land use and restoration, and dry land sustainable landscapes, with dedicated support to 12 countries and, and in the former and 11 countries in the latter. So, New access to climate finance provides new opportunities for countries to accelerate progress on agri-system food systems transformation. And this event, again, will showcase real-world examples of policies, actions, and finance, and how these can help accelerate and scale up action for agri-food systems transformation, and decouple agricultural commodity production from deforestation and land degradation. Because if we can figure out how to do this, we can truly feed the world while protecting the world's forests. So let's be inspired by the event. We've got some music going on. We're happy. We're here. We've got energy. And then we can join efforts and turn some of these commitments into action so that next year at COP28, we can say we've made real progress in agriculture and forestry. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. And I think that point on kind of looking at the examples and how we can bring different stakeholders is together and they're dancing about that next door. Couldn't be more brilliant. <laughs> Um, so our, before we invite our panelists up, we're going to hear from Peter Minang on transforming lives and landscapes with integrated land use and trees. Peter is a director for Africa at the Center for International Forestry Research and World Agroforestry, or C4. And I believe we've got a video from Peter coming from our lovely tech team. Greetings, colleagues, um, distinguished guests, friends. I'm really glad to be here this morning to talk to you about uh, uh, decoupling agriculture from deforestation. Uh, sorry I couldn't make it, but I'm glad that I'm able to, to, to talk, send at least this video to you, talking about a few things that are really important in decoupling agriculture from forest. I'd like to talk about really four pathways through which uh, you can decouple agriculture from deforestation. And these are first zero deforestation, which everybody knows. 
The second pathway is an agronomic pathway. The third one is a, is a value addition and a bioeconomy pathway. And the last one is a governance pathway. Let me start with what you all know, and that's zero deforestation, which is what we all talk about during the COPs, and which is what the EU has taken the lead in terms of developing legislation that allows, you know, uh, uh, enables or, or, or stops deforested commodities from getting into the EU. And, and they've made great strides. I think it's a great one with the legislation. What is needed in that pathway now uh, is that other countries need to come on board in that, uh, that demand side of the equation. And, and, but also on the supply side of the equation, I think uh, countries need to develop sub-national risk categorization systems, but also data systems that can provide the data and verification systems that need to provide the data for verification of those commodities at the, 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 the destination. But zero deforestation, which is what, what we've been talking about, is not enough. Uh, it, it is good, in, it's good, but it's not enough. What I think we need is agronomic pathways that are engaging farmers on the ground. Because the risk with zero deforestation legislation is that it could crowd out smallholder farmers that don't have the resources to do the verification, to georeference their products, and that are not part of a bigger value chain. So we need to engage smallholder farmers with sustainable intensification and sustainable diversification of their systems, like introducing trees in cocoa systems, introducing trees in coffee systems, and doing oil palm in you know, uh, uh, agroforestry systems. I think this will go a long way to help with, with, with decoupling you know, agriculture, because if people produce more, on smaller pieces of land, they don't have to deforest to expand their production. Because currently, that's the only way through which they, they can actually make any, any extra money. The, the third pathway, which is the value addition and bioeconomy pathway, is that even if they produce more, they need to make a little bit more money out of that. Currently, they are not getting enough, even meeting their cost. They can't make a living from three commodities that cause deforestation. So if we can val add value to their products, if we can help them sell in a better way as groups bargain better, if we can help them to you know, connect their products to bioenergy pathways, to diversification of their products, then they'll make a little bit more money, they'll be part of an economic system, and they'll be get out of poverty, and therefore they don't have to deforest. I think the last pathway is a governance pathway there is need for engagement there is need for proper legislation even in developing countries to manage agriculture in a way that is that is important for for deforestation one of the things that we need to look at is enforcement of all of the existing forest policy laws those policies need to come through on the forest side for protection but also that we do need uh, legislation, incentives, uh, economic incentives, but also other incentives that will help the farmers to be able to stop deforestation. And I think that, just to conclude, none of these pathways stand on their own. Zero deforestation is good, but it's not sufficient. We need to engage farmers, we need to help them with better agriculture, more productive agriculture. We need to provide more value for their products and we need to provide legislation. And all of these are important and they need to come together in an integrated way to help us to decouple uh, uh, def uh, agriculture from deforestation. With that, I'll stop and wish you uh, very good deliberations. I wish I was there to, 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 to discuss this further with you, but I'll follow up with, with all of you. Thank you very much for the opportunity and good luck. Thanks, Peter. I think it was really uh, clear to talk about how we can tackle this question with four typologies and importantly, how they're kind of linked to each other. Our second keynote today is from Caroline Merl from the FAO, who I believe is going to share a teaser on the report, which is on your seat if you haven't already looked at the QR code and downloaded it.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. On behalf of FAO Forestry Division, I'm pleased to give a first overview on a study we just developed to understand how large-scale and small-scale farming, respectively, contribute to global deforestation. Our study complement the Forest Resource Assessment Remote Sensing Survey, or FRA-RSS, which results were released during the World Forestry Congress earlier this year. The survey was based on 400,000 samples. Satellite images for each of the sample were visually assessed by more than 800 experts from 126 countries. They observed forest changes over 18 years, divided in two periods, from 2000 to 2010 and from 2010 to 2018. As regard deforestation, which is the permanent conversion of forests into other land uses, the results showed that agriculture was by far the largest driver. Indeed, more than 88% of deforestation was linked to agriculture, with almost 60% due to conversion into cropland and 38.5% to the expansion of livestock grazing. This global figure of 88% can actually hide the diversity of situations leading to deforestation, while understanding those dynamics is key to design efficient policies for more sustainable agri-food systems. Several studies have underlined the role of commercial agriculture in driving forest loss, and we decided to use the extended FRA-RSS database to explore again this aspect of the problematic. First, we clarified the terminology and opted for a distinction between large-scale and small-scale farming, defined in a way that would be compatible with a methodology based on Earth observation techniques. The criteria of investment, capacity, and production methods are key in defining these two categories. The methodology was applied to each sample of the two groups, deforestation due to cropland expansion and to livestock grazing, for a total of around 35,000 samples. Each sample was considered according to a set of criteria established for the study and allocated to one of the two categories, large-scale or small-scale farming. The first result of the study is the validation of the relevant criteria for each region with sufficient samples which are North and Central America, South America, Africa, and Asia. The second set of results gives a share of deforestation happening in a context of large-scale or small-scale farming at global and regional level, and for different agricultural land use, like crops, notably oil palm and livestock. The study is in its validation phase and will soon be published. So please stay tuned following the different links that are shared in this slide. Thanks a lot. Thank Hello. Hello, thanks. Thanks, Caroline. And I think now, as we rearrange the chairs, thanks, Amy. Um, the key thing that sung out from there was the importance of agriculture and forestry working together and how we can decouple those to make sure that we tackle this idea of climate change and food security and nutrition and i'm going to keep hammering that home throughout this whole session um, our panelists today we've got some government representatives and then we've also got some smallholder voices that we're going to hear um, i know there have been some negotiations going on so we might have a kind of flux of people coming in and out um, but it's my pleasure to invite florencia mitchell to the stage, who is the National Director of Climate Change for the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development in Argentina. Where I pick a seat, wherever you like. We've also got August Justiano, who's the Director General of the Sustainable Forest Management in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry from Indonesia. Pleasure to have you here. We've got Veronica Nditu, who's the Head of the Climate Change Unit for the Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya, who I think is in the middle of a negotiation. We've got Janet Morrow, who's a co-founder, Chief Executive Officer for Sustainable Agriculture Tanzania, who I believe will be joining us online for that segment of the panel. And we've got Esther Panunio, who's the Secretary General of the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development. So, 
Florencia, I'm going to come to you first, to Argentina. Um, Argentina is among one of the first countries to receive results-based payments from Red Plus. Um, and this is, is strategically using the opportunity to access this source of climate finance. So our question to you is, how are the Red Plus results-based payments boosting and scaling up sustainable livestock management whilst reducing the environmental impacts of livestock, but also sustaining local livelihoods? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And I will try to speak up so we can hear something. Uh, and maybe we can make them hear something from our side, too, <laughs> and get, it, uh, get a good ideas or inputs from them, too, on our policies. But, well, you introduced me, Katie. I'm from the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development. So probably I'll be focusing more on the deforestation side than on the agricultural and uh, livestock systems. But we're trying to put together policies that actually can make us might make those different lines come together and get a new view on the territory that allow us to make the people stay where they live, get, be, make them have a, sustain, a sustainable way of producing not only their own food but their way of their livelihoods. What they have to do to be, uh, what, how can they both produce and ha get a living out of it, and also taking care of the environment at the same time. But maybe first a little bit of context, apart from what we've got from the result, uh, the result, the results um, based payments. We are a federal country. Argentina is a huge country with provinces. And in, that, in the system we have, every province has the domains on nature, on nature resources, natural resources. So that gives us an extra level of complexity when we have to define these kind of policies. And the instrument we have in our constitution to deal with that kind of things, it's a specific kind of, of law. This is a stand, minimum standards law that has to be applied in all the country, even though the provinces have the domain of nat natural resources. And that's the instrument we use for every environmental issue, and of course, deforestation is one of that. Uh, specifically on deforestation, we have law 20, uh, well, the, the number doesn't matter, of course, but it's a minimum standard on environmental protection of native forest, and that accounts for more than 53 million hectares that are divided for each provinces. Each provinces act actually divide those, uh, those actors in three different kind of protections, three different levels of protections, and levels where they can do different things or different activities. But in most of those actors, 60% of those actors that are category, category two, that's the name in the, in the law, we can have productive activities going on there. And there is where we're trying to put together agriculture and livestock, because in Argentina, actually, it's livestock what is pushing deforestation more than agriculture itself. But we are trying to put together different good practices on livestock production that would make, that could give us uh, a better way of producing meat that, you know, it's, it's not also a big product for Argentina. It's also a cultural thing for Argentina. Beef, it's something cultural in our country. But we also have uh, our national plan on adaptation and mitigation. That's, that's the climate part of the, of the issue. We have uh, a, clim a climate action plan with our horizon in 2030, how to, uh, to fulfill all commitments or NDCs. And in that plan, that it's a roadmap on how to get to those commitments, we're trying to look at these two systems, the agri-food systems and the forestry system in the same strategic lines. So we have measures for both sides and measures that are actually together. And one of them specifically is when uh, what kind of systems we can have in forests that do not um, or put in risk the, for the, the forest themselves. We know that we, are, we all know that there are silvopastoral systems that we can use where we can put together livestock in the forest. But in Argentina, the kind of, the kind of silvopastoral practices that have been uh, going on in the country, specifically in the north, in the Chaco, in the northern part of Argentina, they had led us to what we call parquisacion. It's a kind of degradation of the land because they take, the the, they take out the shrubs. And we, but it, it, that makes the, the forest go poorer in ca some kind of way. So what we did for that, it's get to an agreement within the Secretary of Agriculture and the Ministry of Environment on technical guidelines on how those silver pastoral systems should be. And they have a specific governance in the different provinces that defines what 
what those guidelines mean in each provinces, recognizing the differences on recognizing the difference from the different regions of the of, of the country and the cultural practices and not only natural and ecosystem differences but also social differences in each in each part of the country and that's and we put a name on that on that kind of systems and we call it MBGI uh, in Spanish it would be uh, manejo integrado de bosques y ganadería it's integrated management of livestock and forestry but the good thing is that we put we got to a political and technical agreement on what we meant when we said we have to have a good practice on silvopastoral systems and we put a name on it. <laughs> we put a label just to make it different from any other practices we could have. But the innovation is about governance probably. What are, how are we controlling and assuring that those guidelines and those practices are actually put in place and things that are labeled as MBGI <laughs> are actually MBGI. Thanks, I agree. It's, it's really interesting to hear how one policy can have different implications in different geographies and different kind of cultures as well. And I think bringing in that social cultural element is really critical in, in tackling this kind of question of, of multiple wins. Um, thank you. So we're now going to move over to Indonesia. Um, August, I understand that Indonesia has set an ambitious target of making forestry and other land use sectors a net sink by 2030. And we would love if you could share the kind of key roles of forests in this ambitious target. <coughs> yes, thank you, Katie, for the questions. First, I would like to inform you that recently Indonesia I uh, submitted the enhanced NDC to UNFCCC Secretariat on 23rd September 2022, reflecting an increase in emission reduction targets from 29% uh, to 31.89% uh, uh, unconditionally, and 41% to 43.2% conditionally. This enhanced NDC, of course, is a transition towards uh, Indonesia's second NDC, which will be aligned uh, with the long-term strategy on low carbon and climate resilience uh, 2050, with a vision to achieve net zero emissions by 2060 or sooner. And of course, the forestry and other land uses sector is expected to provide uh, the significant uh, contribution in achieving the NDC target, about 60% from the target. <clears throat> Therefore, the government of Indonesia has initiated an ambitious program which uh, called the Indonesia Follow Net Sing by 2030, or forestry and other land uses. And this initiative was developed based on uh, years of corrective actions and experiences in Indonesia. For example, uh, we have experience in reducing uh, the rate of deforestation. At least during the last three decades, Indonesia has reached its lowest rate of deforestation from million hectares per year to only 113.5 thousand hectares in the period of 2021 to 2022. Indonesia views that uh, the forest and other land uses play a significant role in mitigating as well as adapting to climate change, especially to the state forest areas which covering uh, two-thirds of the land in Indonesia. Therefore, Indonesia uh, consider FOLU is the main sector in achieving our NDC target. In order to achieve the Indonesia FOLU Nesting 2030, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia continues to improve the implementation which, which we call the multi-business-based forest management. The multi-forestry business uh, concept includes forest area utilization, timber and non-timber forest product utilization, and environmental service utilization to get uh, greater uh, forest benefits, particularly in the protection and production forest. It becomes an entry strategy to achieve optimum forest uh, resource utilization and green investment development. It is expected that the new system will uh, significantly increase <coughs> economic value of forest, <coughs> resulting from uh, optimum uh, forest resources utilization, 
and then increase forest cover, improve uh, forest productivity, and also agriculture productivity and forest product export, and of course, greater job opportunities. Thank you. It's great to hear not only of the um, deforestation reduction targets that you know are already being met in Indonesia, and also how policy can support the role of businesses. We were going to turn to Veronica and Ditu, but I believe she's still in negotiations. Yeah. So we'll move over to the smallholder lens section of our panel, and we're going to turn over to. Janet Maro, who I think is going to be joining us online to talk about her experience in supporting smallholder farmers in Tanzania and what are the examples of how dry lands can transition to more agroecological practices through these, these examples. Thanks, Janet. Yes, good evening, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be able to join uh, this panel discussion uh, this time. And um, my name is Janet Maro. I work with Sustainable Agriculture Tanzania. We are a local non governmental organization based in Morogoro. And um, I, I, I'm really impressed with the presentations that have just taken place. And uh, I was following closely. Uh, for us as Sustainable Agriculture Tanzania, and in particular with regards to our center, which I would like to share a bit, uh, I have a very short, oh, okay, I cannot share. I have a very short, I had a very short PowerPoint presentation, which would have uh, had some photos, and so you could really be able to see a bit uh, our center and how we're using agroecological methods, but also uh, using agroforestry and as a result we are able to really uh, adapt but also to really regenerate our area and be able to grow healthy nutritious food while oh. conserving the environment as we know agriculture has a very big uh, possibility to contribute uh, to, to contribute to providing ecosystem services which are vital uh, at this uh, period where we work hard to get uh, more carbon in the soil, reduce uh, more, uh, we, we reduce pollution in the atmosphere and uh, sequester more carbon. And so we are really happy that with the practices we are using, with uh, using compost, but also planting green manure and cover crops, which help to get, uh, to, to improve the soil organic matter and put organic uh, carbon, uh, uh, store carbon in the soil. And also the trees that we plant in our systems, which enable, uh, which enable the area to, uh, which enable the area, uh, which enable really um, the carbon sequestration. I see now I'm able to share yeah, my Janet. presentation. I believe you've been and given permission. So please, please allow me to to share very, uh, very briefly in this short time. So. Yes, we are a local non-governmental organization based in the Morogoro region of Tanzania. We work with over 27,000 farmers, and our vision is that majority of farmers use acknowledged agroecological methods to improve their livelihoods, conserve the environment, and reduce pressure on natural resources. On this picture, we see land that has been regenerated with planted grass, and this is a um, a pastoral community which does uh, keeping of livestock and we see a lot of improvement in this area the and sat as an organization we have four major pillars but today i will talk about networking and how it is important to collaborate between farmers between researchers between uh, policy makers uh, and as uh, with the collaboration and networking we are able to find solutions to challenging problems that agriculture is facing, but also to really uh, find solutions uh, how we can mitigate, but also adapt uh, to climate change. As uh, temperatures are increasing and we need to find ways on how, innovative ways on how we can reduce the extreme, e extreme temperatures, but also um, uh, deal when we have uh, some disasters, for example, floods, and how we can stop soil erosion and uh, all the problems that come with the changes in, in, in climate. And also the pillar of dissemination of knowledge whereby we work on the ground in the villages and we, pro, uh, we, we make together with farmers 
learning, learning pots in the villages and farmers are able to see and practice together with us, uh, together with our facilitators, uh, integration of crops and livestock. And we work from the ground up. We, uh, in, in the farm, we keep uh, bees, we also grow spices, and uh, uh, this slide, uh, this is our, from our, uh, our spice producing groups. And here you can see the different uh, seedlings, but also the trees in the system and how the farm is integrated. And uh, we have been able to plant over 250,000 uh, spice seedlings, which are growing in the fields. And we have another 185,000 seedlings that are in the nursery for planting next uh, rainy season. And uh, this is from our farmer training center. As farmers, we have seen and observed that this area receives less than 500 millimeters of rainfall. And uh, such an integrated system with trees, uh, these are legume trees which produce uh, a lot of biomass, which we use in the field where we have maize. And um, so maize benefits with the biomass from our trees. And these trees on the lines planted in this way along the contours, the bigger trees along the contours, help to reduce the speed of water when it's raining. And as a result, we have more water preserved and conserved in the soil and stored in the soil for a bit longer, helping to make our plants grow and reach maturity. A situation that if we did not uh, do this soil water conservation measure, we would not be able to have the maize growing and reaching maturity successfully because it will not have enough moisture to grow. And oftentimes uh, it's forgotten that maize or any crop does not just need uh, nutrients, but there is also uh, the moisture, which is very vital for the plant to be able to grow very well. So agroforestry, and as seen, uh, as seen here at SAT, really provides a very good solution and option for farmers to be able to grow crops. And uh, also with these plants, especially the trees, as you know, in many rural areas of Africa and Tanzania, there is the use of firewood for cooking, which is also very detrimental to the environment and is a major cause of deforestation. So when farmers are planting such trees, and when you do, you add the biomass in the soil, this tree is very good for coppicing. And so you have these branches which you can use as also firewood for the kitchen. And combined with uh, energy saving stoves, you reduce the amount of firewood that you use in the, in the fields. And this is my last picture that I opted to share this evening. And here we show intercropping using uh, also flowers that are very good for, uh, for producing, for attracting bees and uh, other pollinators like wasps, which also in, in the end help to, uh, to, to keep our natural pests from our fields. And in this plot, this is a vegetable plot. We have uh, spinach, we have uh, sweet pepper, uh, we have amaranthus, and then of course we have artemisia. We have all these trees around which are very important for the ecosystem and habitat for other organisms and animals and insects to, to live. We believe that coexisting and having an environment where, uh, where uh, different organisms uh, live and help each other makes the system quite resilient. And also uh, when the system is resilient, you have healthier plants and less pests uh, less harmful pests or less insects that are destroying the crops. And um, here is some few links to uh, some videos where there is more information about that, where you can watch and see. And thank you so much for this opportunity. I know I've spent a bit more than five minutes, but since uh, one of uh, my fellow panelists has not been able to make it, I hope this covers up a bit and it's not a big problem for the coming uh, for, for those presenting afterwards. Thank you so much for this opportunity and I look forward to hear if there will be any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Janet. That was brilliant. And I'm glad we had you for some extra time and we got to see your slides because I really think they show the kind of diversity of the different agroecological methods that you're using and that we can have farming that also supports nature and, and improves resilience, not in the short term, but in the kind of long term as well. 
We have also now been joined by Esther. Hi, Esther. If you'd like to come up, Esther is the Secretary General of the Asian Farmers Association. Um, and our kind of question to you, Esther, building on what Janet said, is what, are the, what is the role of forest and farm producer organizations in scaling up sustainable production or transforming existing practices to kind of be more sustainable? Thanks. Thank you for your question. And there is a very big role now for forest and farm producer organizations like us. Uh, our organization is Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, or AFA. And we have members in 16 countries in Asia and uh, comprising around 13 million small scale women, men, and young family farmers. Now, and engage in crops, in livestock, in fisheries, forestry, herding, and pastoralism. So we've got a good mix now of family farmers in our organization. So what is the role of the forest and farm producer organizations like us? First, we see ourselves as a consolidator. Okay? We consolidate two things. First is the wealth of our members. So the wealth will be in terms of money as well as in terms of non-money. So how, how, how for money? Now through our cooperatives, because we establish cooperatives, we pull the capital of our members so that we could use this capital to provide other services like savings or credit or insurance, uh, production loans like that. Some cooperatives, they are very big that they are able to provide economic services from what we say from womb to tomb. No? Giving, for example, maternity benefits to their women members up to funeral benefits for their members because they already have big uh, big assets now because of the many uh, services that members pay to them when they get these services so that's one we consolidate the wealth of our members second is uh, we consolidate the non-material wealth and what will be the non-material wealth of our members? Basically, the knowledge that we have, the experience that we have in doing agroecology, in doing integrated, diversified, organic farming, fishing, and forestry, the one that, for example, Janet said. So our organization, with the help of development partners like FFF, the Forest and Farm Facility, we do a lot of exchanges, physical exchanges, face to face. The last one was we did last uh, September, end of September, when we went to Vietnam and we saw how women-led cooperatives were really able to help their members uh, in increasing their incomes by connecting them to markets, like markets for their acacia plywood, now, for example. So. This kind, we can we also do um, uh, knowledge management products like uh, making case studies, making videos, putting them on Facebook or on our website so that and translating these videos into the local languages of our members so that more farmers will be able to see what other farmers in the region are doing. So that's first a role consolidator. The second is maybe also like consolidator, but we consolidate the voice of millions of farmers. Now, policymakers like our the people, colleagues here, you do not want to talk to millions of farmers. Huh? Too much time, <laughs> too much time. But you talk to only one representative, but that representative is duly elected by the members, and that representative uh, is able to listen first to the members and then bring that voice to you. 
That is one role of family farmer, forest and farm producer organizations. We bring the voice of small scale farmers at the local level, at the national level, at the regional level, and even here at the global level in COP27. We are here to, to uh, raise the voice of small-scale farmers. Before going here, we, we, with the help of the forest and farm facility, we conducted national consultations. And we invited the national governments who will be negotiating here to engage us to listen to us, to our members at the country level. And then we had a regional exchange before coming here, a week before coming here, to know what is the result of the national consultation and to draft a statement. We made a statement for the Asia Pacific farmers' uh, voice. And we bring, and when we are here inside events like this, we voice it out because we know that we have the mandate of our members. So this is the thing, the two roles of the forest and farm producer organizations, consolidator of the wealth and the voice of the farmers in Asia Pacific. Thank you. Thanks so much, Esther, that was brilliant. And in answer to the question, the role of associations is absolutely critical, which I think you made brilliantly. We're now going to kind of jump back to the to the countries to kind of hear about how we can further kind of support the role of, of farmers and smallholders on the ground. So going back to you in Argentina, Veronica, you kind of touched on the national plan earlier, but we would really like to kind of hear about when it comes to climate change and food security, what are the innovative aspects presented in this national plan, especially in terms of livestock and supporting farmers? Well, of course, Changing practices on livestock producing has an imp a positive impact on, cl on climate change, on, not on climate change themselves, but on emissions on one hand. We are looking for a sustainable way of producing, and that includes low emission schemes to produce livestock. But for us too, every, every practice we are looking for, it actually has, a, uh, what, we're, what we're looking behind is to halt deforestation and deforestation and halting deforestation has a big impact on adaptation as adaptation measure. In our country, deforestation means also like the unbalance of hydric uh, systems and we are going through processes of um, drought and floods all the time and deforestation push, for, push a little bit farther that kind of consequences. So the, uh, avoiding deforestation and degradation of forests, it's also a way to adapt our country and the producers to, to climate change impacts we are already seeing in the, in the territory. But on the innovative side of this, uh, this plan, we are, we are trying to put forward, and I, now I realize that I never answered your question from before, and how it results based payment, payments are helping us in this, in, this, in this plan, that of course it's complementing what we are already doing in the, in the national law and in the, this specific uh, plan. But one of the innovative uh, things we're doing is having defined what we understand as sustainable practice with this um, management, forest management with integrated livestock farming. We are building up upon that building uh, certification schemes that will help those producers to get into markets, new international markets that are coming out and getting better incomes. Farmers and uh, the people in the, in the uh, producing livestock would, get, would be able to get into those, into those markets. But another innovative thing was the governance itself I was talking about previously. We have a national committee on this kind of plan and we have uh, provincial committees that are defining what uh, the sustainable practices mean for each one of the regions. And I think that's also a very innovative way of looking, of approaching the systems, the, agri the agricultural and livestock um, syst uh, pr production systems, because there's no one solution fits all. <laughs> there's no way uh, where you have so many differences and so many different ecosystems, but as I said before, cultural ways of producing, there's no way to have one solution. So we have to adapt it and we have to put it, uh, to put it forward in the different ways. So those committees are also helping us in that way. Thanks so much. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna go straight back to Indonesia, to you, August, to, to hear about how Indonesia is making progress to reduce deforestation whilst also ensuring agricultural productivity and sustainable livelihoods, but in the broader context of 
economic development? Well, uh, in the context of achieving our uh, enhanced uh, greenhouse gases emission uh, reduction through the agenda of Indonesia follow nesting by 2030, as I mentioned before, uh, the government of Indonesia is promoting which we call uh, multi-business-based forest management. That is shifting the forest management paradigm from the timber-based management into forest landscape management. Through this uh, multi-business-based forest management, the stakeholders are expected to optimize the utilization of forest area, which may include uh, the partnership of forest management with the local community by developing uh, local economic through agroforestry, silver fishery, and silver pasture. So furthermore, we also view that the restoration and rehabilitation of watershed and forest ecosystem will play important uh, role in not only uh, provide significant contribution to the emission reduction target achievement, but also local economic development. In Indonesia, the forest restoration and rehabilitation program are part of the national economic recovery program which directing all the activities to involve the local community in the implementation i can state that the government of indonesia of course has developed a climate action program that always involving the community therefore this can uh, become an example that the climate uh, action program not only about tackling the, the, change, the changing climate, but also as a program to improve the economic welfare, of, especially for the for local community. Finally, I would like to conclude that the, in ensuring sustainable livelihood and economies while maintaining the commitment to reducing deforestation and carbon emissions, the Ministry of Environment of, and Forestry is promoting that all economic activities can be developed in forest areas as long as uh, socially accepted and ecologically sustainable. So Indonesia wants to ensure that uh, every inch of forest land can be managed in sustainable way. That's brilliant and really fantastic to hear about kind of every inch of forest being used sustainably and how we can really engage producers at different levels within this. I think we've got time for some Q&A with the audience. Um, if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask any of our three panelists. Don't be shy. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm Valeria Pesce I'm for the, from the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation. My question is, Esther said uh, the policymakers, of course, don't go and talk to all the small scale farmers. There are representatives. And uh, my question would be actually to the other two speakers whether, in, uh, in, uh, I mean, when, when they have to make decisions, how do they involve the farmers and how participatory the process is when they have to make decisions regarding the coupling agriculture from the forestation? Thank you. Since I have the micro microphone, maybe, may I start? <laughs> Uh, well, actually, that when it comes going back to the to the law and the, um, and the native forest land management, the, what what we the, the different maps we have to set with the three different categories of conservation we have within the law. That's a process provinces have to hold have to hold with uh, with participation. They have to call all the stakeholders in to define those maps, and it, that's in the law itself. The law says that you have to build those maps and the categorization of the heck of the native forest hectares into these categories with the participation of small of, of small producers, big producers, and every uh, stakeholder. But we have a specific focus on small producers, obvious, uh, for obvious reasons, because sometimes they don't have the voice, and they have to, and we have to help them speak up. <laughs> and when it comes to uh, climate change planning, which also it's also complementary to the law. We take in we take in the the law and try to set a, set new measures that would push even further all what it's stated in the law. We have a specific national cabinet on climate change, where we call all the stakeholders to. We have the cabinet has of course a, a roundtable of ministers that 
make their fin the, the final decisions at the end of the process, but they take inputs from different roundtables with different stakeholders, and one of them is specifically about uh, agriculture and decoupling deforestation, decoupling it from deforestation. Yes, uh, actually uh, we have uh, some example. Yeah. For, uh, for example, we have a uh, social forestry program. So uh, in the social forestry maps, we also involve the, the, the stakeholders in uh, developing the, that map. And uh, before we give the permit to the, the, the local community, for example, in the social forestry program, we, we also uh, uh, provide the, the the mechanism through the public consultation, and that's involve uh, all stakeholders, including the local community. So we can ensure that our uh, policy can be implemented, yeah, in the field. Because if there is no involvement of the the stakeholder in the process of uh, policy making, that uh, will be a, a, a challenge for. For us, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please ask a question. I was going to come to you to ask one to the other two panelists. Yes, thank you. I'm very happy to be with government representatives from Argentina and Indonesia because in Argentina we have a, a network partner, Coprofam. It's a regional family farmers organization. Also, and I know that in Argentina they are they are able to engage their government. They are small family farmers. And in Indonesia, uh, in 2015, we had a project with GIFAR. Uh, it's on participatory grassroots foresight exercise. And one of the pil three pilot countries is Indonesia. And we did it with the Boru people, Boru indigenous tribes somewhere down south in Indonesia. And, and they are indigenous peoples, and they really wanted to really have some rights to their forest lands, as well as um, have their culture intact and have economic livelihoods from their forest. And we did that. It was like a visioning exercise. It's a foresight exercise. They had an action plan. And one of the action plan was to go to the Ministry of Forest and get a social forestry certificate, is that it? Certificate, and they got it from your ministry. Thank you. So that's how we engage as an organization. Thank you, and I'm really glad we sparked that conversation kind of on how different stakeholders can work together. We've got a few minutes left, so I was just going to... Time for one more question? Yeah. Th thank you. Uh, Johnson Dokosho is my name. I'm the director of forestry from the Republic of Namibia. I uh, want to ask uh, my sister from Argentina, because you said <laughs> she was talking about uh, the land is being converted because of livestock. Uh, is, it, is it that people are clearing the land for them to graze livestock? And if that's the case, maybe uh, what about if they uh, graze the animals in the forest, because we have the same situation. We are we are also a beef producing, but maybe not at the scale of Argentina. But uh, we basically range our or graze our animals in the community forest and state forest and whatnot. So that way we are able at least to to conserve some trees. But at the same time, we are achieving the the livestock production. Maybe uh, in Argentina you could also do that. Thank you. It's oh, there. It's working. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, yes. Of course, it's livestock. If we've got to be true, it's agriculture pushing livestock production into the forests, into the forest land. It's both processes going hand by hand. But when you we all right, we of course had this kind of silver pastoral systems where we have the animals uh, grazing within forest. But what we started to see that. It was that that kind of systems were also degradating the forest themselves. And then is when we started to think together with the Ministry of Agriculture, what, what could we do to stop that kind of degradation that would let us 
to deforestation at the end. So what we, what we decided to do is to define what the, b the best criteria for those silver pastoral systems to be, uh, to be deployed. And that's what we are doing with uh, forest management with integrate uh, livestock farming is coming, is coming to do. So define how to do those grazing within the, within the forest, not to degrade it. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Thank, oh yeah. Thank you. Uh, so kind of three key things that stand out from today is that we can decouple agriculture from deforestation. And we've heard some examples of how this can be done. The, the key thing that we need is integrated approaches and collaboration. This includes government action that shapes specific policies at different levels and different scales, and that also bringing producer organizations at the heart of this, this process as consolidators. So yeah, thank you everyone. I encourage you to read the report and thank you for this collaboration between Folu and the FAO.